the crisis of the Jacobin dictatorship. The brief period of the Jacobin dictatorship was the greatest time of the revolution. The Jacobins managed to awaken the napping forces of the people, to inspire indomitable energy with courage, courage, readiness for self-sacrifice, fearlessness, daring. But with all its immense greatness, for all its historical progressiveness, the Jacobin dictatorship still did not overcome the limitations inherent in any bourgeois revolution. In the very foundation of the Jacobin dictatorship, as in the policy pursued by the Jacobins, deep internal contradictions lay. The Jacobins fought for the complete triumph of freedom, democracy, equality in the form in which these ideas were presented to the great bourgeois revolutionary democrats of the 18th century. But by crushing and uprooting feudalism, sweeping away all the old, medieval, feudal rubbish and all those who tried to save it, according to Marx's expression, the Jacobins cleared the ground for the development of bourgeois, capitalist relations. They ultimately created the conditions for replacing one form of exploitation of another, feudal exploitation, capitalist. The Jacobin revolutionary democratic dictatorship subjected to strict state regulation the sale and distribution of products and other goods sent speculators and violators of maximum laws to the guillotine. As Lenin pointed out, the French petty bourgeois, the most brilliant and most sincere revolutionaries, was still excusable of striving to defeat the speculator with the executions of individual, few elected, and thunderous declarations, by Lenin, O Food Tax, Works, Volume 32, p. 310. However, since state intervention was carried out only in the sphere of distribution, without affecting the mode of production, the entire repressive policy of the Jacobin government and all its efforts in the field of state regulation could not weaken the economic power of the bourgeoisie. Moreover, during the years of the revolution, the economic power of the bourgeoisie as a class increased significantly as a result of the elimination of feudal land ownership and the sale of national property. The war, which violated the usual economic ties, which made huge demands on all areas of economic life, also created, in spite of the restrictive measures of the Jacobins, favorable conditions for enriching the clever dealers. Of all the gaps, from all times of society liberated from feudal fetters, an enterprising, impudent, greedy new bourgeoisie grew up, whose ranks were continually replenished by the descendants of the petty bourgeois sections of the city and the prosperous peasantry. Speculation on scarce goods, playing a changing course of money, selling and reselling land, huge supplies for the army and the military department, accompanied by all kinds of fraud and fraud all served as a source of rapid, almost fabulous enrichment for the new bourgeoisie. The policy of repression of the Jacobin government could neither stop, nor even weaken this process. At the risk of laying down their heads on the scaffold, all those who grew up over the years of the revolution, intoxicated by the opportunity to create a huge fortune in the shortest possible time, the rich uncontrollably tore to profit and knew how to bypass the maximum laws, ban speculation and other restrictive measures of the revolutionary government. Until the outcome of the struggle against the external and internal feudal counter-revolution was resolved, the proprietary elements were forced to put up with the revolutionary regime. But as the danger of feudal restoration weakened thanks to the victories of the republican armies, the bourgeoisie more and more determined to get rid of the revolutionary democratic dictatorship. Like the urban bourgeoisie, the prosperous and even middle peasants evolved, supporting the Jacobins only until the first decisive victories. Like the bourgeoisie, the property sections of the village were hostile to the policy of the maximum, sought to abolish hard prices, and tried immediately and completely, without any restrictions, prohibitions, requisitions, to take advantage of what had been acquired during the years of the revolution. Meanwhile, the Jacobins continued to pursue their policy of terror and maximum unswervingly. In early 1794, they made an attempt to implement new socio-economic measures at the expense of large owners. 8 and 13 Van Hosa, late February, 
Early March, the Convention on the Report of St. Just took important, decisively important decrees. According to these so-called Vanta decrees, the property of persons recognized as enemies of the revolution was subject to confiscation and free distribution among the poor. Enemies of the revolution at that time were considered not only the former aristocrats, but also numerous representatives of the old, Felian and Girondin, and the new bourgeoisie, in particular speculators who violated the law on maximum. In the Warta's decrees, the equalizing aspirations of the Jacobins, the disciples and followers of Rousseau, were reflected. If the Fantas decrees were enforced, this would mean a significant increase in the number of small proprietors, primarily from the ranks of the poor. However, the proprietary elements oppose the implementation of the Wartaz decrees. At the same time, the internal contradictoriness of the policy of the Jacobins led to a growing discontent at the other extreme, in the ranks of the plebeian defenders of the revolution. The Jacobins did not provide the conditions for real improvement in the financial position of the plebeians. Having established the maximum for foodstuffs under the pressure of the popular masses, the Jacobins also extended it to the wages of the workers, causing them considerable harm. They left in force the anti-labor law of Le Chapelier. The hired workers, devoted fighters of the revolution, selflessly working for the defense of the republic, who took an active part in political life, in the lower bodies of the revolutionary democratic dictatorship revolutionary committees, revolutionary clubs and people's societies, became increasingly discontent with the policy of the Jacobins. The Jacobin dictatorship did not fulfill the aspirations of the rural poor. The sale of national property was used mainly by the well-off peasantry, who bought up most of the land. In these years, the differentiation of the peasantry was steadily increasing. The poor sought to limit the size of the farms, the possessions of wealthy peasants, seizing their surplus land and dividing it among the have-nots, but the Jacobins did not dare to support these demands. Local authorities usually took the side of the rich peasants in their conflicts with agricultural workers. All this also caused discontent with the Jacobin policy among the poor in the village. The struggle in the ranks of the Jacobins. The aggravation of internal contradictions in the country and the crisis of the revolutionary dictatorship led to the struggle in the ranks of the Jacobins. In the autumn of 1793, two opposition groups began to form among the Jacobins. The first of them was formed around Danton, one of the most influential leaders of the revolution at its previous stages, who at one time enjoyed great popularity among the people along with Robespierre and Marat. Danton showed hesitation even in the decisive days of the struggle with the Girondins. In the words of Marx, Danton, Despite the fact that he was on the summit of the mountain, to a certain extent was the leader of the swamp K. Marx, the struggle of the Jacobins with the Girondins, K. Marx and F. Engels, S.O.C.H., Volume 3, p. 609. After the forced withdrawal from the Committee of Public Salvation, Danton retired for a while, but... Remaining in the shadow, he became an attractive center around which eminent figures of the convention and the Jacobin club were grouped. Camille de Moulins, Faber d'Eglantine and others. With a few exceptions, all these were persons directly or indirectly associated with the rapidly growing new bourgeoisie. The grouping of Dantonists was soon defined as an outspoken right wing, representing a new bourgeoisie that had become rich over the years of the revolution. In the pages of the newspaper, Old Cordelier, edited by De Moulin, in their speeches and articles the Dantonists acted as supporters of the policy of moderation, the descent of the revolution on breaks. Dantonists more or less frankly demanded the rejection of the policy of terror and the gradual liquidation of the revolutionary democratic dictatorship. In matters of foreign policy, they sought an agreement with Britain and the other participants in the counter-revolutionary coalition, so as to achieve peace at any price as soon as possible. But the policy of the Robespierre's Committee of Public Salvation met the opposition on the left. The Paris Commune and the sections reflected this discontent.
they sought ways to alleviate the poverty of the poor, insisted on pursuing a policy of severe repression against speculators, violators of the law on maximum, etc. However, they did not have a clear and definite program of action. The most influential left group in Paris after the defeat of the rabid or the supporters of Jaumet and Eber, the left-wing Jacobins, or Ebertists, as they were later called historians, who accepted a number of demands of the rabid. The degree of unity and homogeneity of the Ebertists was not great. Eber, 1757-1794, who was a ticket holder in the theater before the revolution, was promoted as one of the active figures in the Cordelier Club. In the autumn of 1793, when Zhao Met became the public prosecutor of the Commune, the most prominent representative of the left-wing Jacobins, Ebra, was appointed deputy. Able journalist, Eber gained fame with his newspaper, Father Duchesne, popular in the popular neighborhoods of Paris. In the autumn of 1793, between the Ebertists, whose influence was then strong in the Paris Commune, and the Robespierreists, serious discrepancies arose on religious policy issues. In Paris and here and there in the province, the Ebertists began to implement the policy of the Christianization, accompanied by the closure of churches, the compulsion of the clergy to renounce the rank, etc. These measures, carried out mainly by administrative measures, came up against the resistance of the masses, especially the peasantry. Robespierre strongly condemned the violent, Dutch-Ristinization, and it was discontinued. But the struggle between the Ebertists and the Robespierres continued. In the spring of 1794, the Ebertists, in connection with the deterioration of the food situation in the capital, intensified criticism of the activities of the Committee of Public Salvation. The Cordelier Club they led was preparing to call a new people's movement, this time directed against the committee. However, Eber and his supporters were arrested, convicted by the Revolutionary Tribunal and executed on March 24. A week later, the government dealt a blow to the Dantonists. On April 2, Danton, Demoulin and others were committed to the Revolutionary Tribunal and on 5 April were guillotined. After defeating the Dantonists, the revolutionary government eliminated the force that had become harmful and dangerous for the revolution. But, striking with one hand the enemies of the revolution, the Jacobin leaders with the other hand struck a blow at its defenders, was removed from the war office and soon arrested Bushworth. Although Eber's call for rebellion was not supported by Chao Met and the Paris Commune, however, Chao Met was also executed. From the Paris Commune, the revolutionary police, the sections expelled all suspected sympathizers of the Ebertists. To cut the independence of the Paris Commune, it was headed by a national agent appointed by the government. All these events aroused discontent in the revolutionary capital. Robespierre cut off part of the forces that supported the Jacobin dictatorship. The situation of the revolutionary government seemed to be seemingly established. Any open expression of discontent, any form of vowel opposition to the revolutionary government ceased. But this external impression of the strength and strength of the Jacobin dictatorship was deceptive. In fact, the Jacobin dictatorship experienced an acute crisis caused by the new socio-political situation prevailing in the country after the victory over the feudal monarchist counter-revolution. Meanwhile, the Jacobins, meeting increasing hostility from the urban and rural bourgeoisie and at the same time losing their support in the popular masses, did not and could not find ways to overcome this crisis. Leaders of the revolutionary government, Robespierre and his supporters tried to strengthen the Jacobin dictatorship by establishing a new state religion, the cult of the Supreme Being, the idea of which was borrowed from Rousseau. June 8, 1794 in Paris was held dedicated to the Supreme Being solemn celebration, during which Robespierre acted as a kind of high priest. But this measure only damaged the revolutionary government in Robespierre. June 10, 1794, the convention, at the insistence of Robespierre, 
passed a new law that greatly enhanced terror. Within six weeks of the publication of this law, the Revolutionary Tribunal issued up to 50 death sentences daily. The victory under Flores has strengthened the intention of broad strata of the bourgeoisie and peasant proprietors, who are extremely dissatisfied with the intensification of terror, and get rid of the regime of the revolutionary democratic dictatorship, which was oppressive to them. Counter-Revolutionary Coup of the Ninth Armator Avoiding punishments, the Dantonists and the deputies of the convention close to them, as well as people close to the Ebertists, entered into secret relations with the aim of eliminating Robespierre and other leaders of the Committee of Public Salvation. By July 1794, a new conspiracy against the revolutionary government arose in deep underground. Its main organizers were persons who feared severe punishment for their crimes, unprincipled, stained with theft and lawlessness while serving as commissar in Bordeaux Tallinn, the same extortionist and bribe taker Frerin, former aristocrat, depraved cynic and acquisitive Barros, a deceitful, dexterous, quirky fauchet, recalled from Lyon for complicity in criminal atrocities and dark deeds. Not only many of the members of the convention, including swamp deputies, but also some members of the Committee for Public Rescue, for example, close to the Ebert Escaletier Boys and Bill Lovarens and the Committee for Public Security were involved in the conspiracy. Subjective moods and intentions of individuals involved in the conspiracy were different, but objectively this plot was of a counter-revolutionary nature. Robespierre and other leaders of the revolutionary government guessed about the coup d'etat, but no longer had the strength to prevent it. July 27, 1794, 9 Thermator 2 year of the revolutionary calendar, the conspirators openly addressed the meeting of the convention against Robespierre, did not allow him to speak and demanded his arrest. Immediately arrested were Robespierre, his younger brother Augustin and his closest associates, Saint Just, Cauton and Le Bas. The Paris Commune rose to defend the revolutionary government. Under her order, the arrested were released and taken to the town hall. The Commune proclaimed an uprising against the counter-revolutionary majority of the convention and appealed to the Paris sections to send its armed forces to its disposal. The convent, for its part, outlawed Robespierre and other persons arrested with him, as well as the leaders of the Commune, and appealed to the sections to demand the assistance of the Convention in suppressing the mutiny. Half of the Paris sections, and above all the central sections inhabited by the bourgeoisie, took the side of the Convention. Many other sections have taken a neutral position or split, but a number of plebeian sections joined the movement against the Convention. Meanwhile, the Commune was indecisive and did not take any active measures against the Convention. Armed detachments, which at the call of the Commune gathered in the square in front of the town hall, began to disperse. At two o'clock in the morning the armed forces of the Convention almost reached the town hall almost unhindered and broke into it. Together with the members of the Commune, Robespierre and his associates were again arrested. On July 28th, 10 Thermitter, the leaders of the Jacobin government and the Commune, outlawed, were guillotined without a court. The executions of the adherents of the revolutionary government continued for the next two days. The turn of the 9th Thermitter overthrew the revolutionary democratic Jacobin dictatorship and thereby effectively put an end to the revolution. The Historical Significance of the French Revolution the French bourgeois revolution of the late 18th century had the largest progressive significance. First of all, it consisted in the fact that this revolution put an end to feudalism and absolutism as decisively as no other bourgeois revolution. The great French revolution was led by the bourgeois class. But the tasks facing this revolution could be achieved only because its main driving force was the masses of the people of the peasantry and urban plebeians. The French Revolution was a people's revolution, and this was its strength. The active, decisive participation of the masses gave the revolution the breadth and breadth by which it differed from other bourgeois revolutions. The French Revolution of the late 18th century 
remained a classic example of the most complete bourgeois democratic revolution. The great French bourgeois revolution predetermined the subsequent development along the capitalist path not only of France itself, it shattered the foundations of feudal absolutist order and accelerated the development of bourgeois relations in other European countries. Under its direct influence, a bourgeois revolutionary movement arose in Latin America. Describing the historical significance of the French bourgeois revolution, Lenin wrote, Take the great French revolution. It is called a great one. For her class, for which she worked, for the bourgeoisie, she did so much that the whole of the 19th century, the century that gave civilization and culture to the whole of mankind, passed under the sign of the French Revolution. He did it only in every part of the world, which he carried out, carried out by parts, completed what the great French revolutionaries of the bourgeoisie had created, via Lenin, first all Russian Congress on out-of-school education, speech on the deception of the people with the slogans of freedom and equality, May 19th, Collected Works, Volume 29, P. 342. However, the historical progressiveness of the French bourgeois revolution, like of any other bourgeois revolution, was limited. It liberated the people from the chains of feudalism and absolutism, but imposed new chains on it the chains of capitalism.